I said that I wanted to push all those things, uh, those, I think, for us, uh, fairly um, peculiar, exotic uh, formulations of Deleuze, uh, of that particular private language, I wanted to push that in the direction of something which is at least more familiar to me and probably to you too, namely the German tradition, the dialectical tradition, because um, familiar if, only if in the sense that we've, we've, uh, we've talked about some of those formulations before, uh, not to rob Deleuze of his originality, but to show that uh, finally uh, uh, these things are talking about the same phenomenon and are, uh, are making attempts to um, offer models of, uh, of uh, analogous uh, perceptions of an analogous reality. And so uh, uh, ultimately um, uh, they've got to be considered together. Uh, so I want to suggest that um, the whole question of decoding uh, the breaking down in this Deleuze private language of a code into, or the transformation of a code, which is a kind of meaningful thing, into an axiomatic, which is a sort of non-meaningful uh, uh, set of um, items, uh, is uh, talking about the same reality that the dialectical tradition, the German tradition, described uh, in various ways as... Uh, well, with Schiller, for example, division of labor, fragmentation, uh, later on with Weber, rationalization, and with Lukács, reification, and so forth. Uh, now, um, uh, one of the great objections that's been made to the dialectical tradition um, is that it's a two-term system. It works with this notion of subject and object. So that implicit in the system is some kind of mirage or optical illusion of a utopian term, the Frankfurt School like to call it reconciliation, or that's, well, that's Hegel too, you know, when the subject and the object uh, are reunited in some ultimate synthesis. Now, um, the, uh, the, the, this is um, uh, one of the catchphrases that's used to criticize this is in Martin Jay's book on the Frankfurt School. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's objected that this is a kind of identity thesis uh, and that it's therefore utopian and uh, that there can never be such a utopian reconciliation. You understand that this is also a kind of uh, anti-political thing in the sense that it suggests that um, uh, there, there is no, uh, there is no social order free from contradiction, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, and, and so, uh, the dialectical tradition, and I think this holds true as much for the Frankfurt School as for Lukács or for Hegel himself or whatever. Uh, it's suggested that the, this dialectical tradition is somehow secretly idealist in that. Um, no matter what it says, its terms ultimately end up uh, implying this uh, final synthesis. Well, uh, you see how in Deleuze's scheme of things, um, that's um, forestalled. Because when you have the idea of the socius or the body without organs that's, uh, that's next to the subject-object split, that is never the same as the subject and object, that's a kind of totalization without content that's always operating alongside, then you can't imagine any ultimate synthesis, you see. All you can imagine is simply a different form of the body without organs. So when they talk about the future, or when they refuse to talk about the future, they'll, say, they'll talk about it in terms of not imagining uh, an overcoming of the gaps in this desiring machine model but simply imagining a new socius, a new type of, uh, of body without organs. So in a sense, if you like, and if you're bothered by the whole notion of totalization, uh, that's, a, um, uh, that's a somewhat different way of, of conceiving things. At any rate, uh, uh, it seems to me fruitful to, to, to put those two traditions together um, uh, in order to, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to serve as a kind of conceptual background for the things that, that, that we're doing um, uh, today. Now, what I want to do today, the issue I want to raise today is, uh, and we've been talking around it, I guess, in, in many ways, is this. Uh, is it legitimate um, to talk about, um, to, uh, is it legitimate to um, 
project a periodization of literary history such that uh, uh, we see contemporary literature uh, as a new something, as a new stage, as a new moment. Um, is it uh, legitimate, therefore, I've, I've tended to operate, maybe without explaining myself fully, on a kind of identification of a number of different strands where uh, uh, I've taken schizophrenic literature uh, that is uh, a, a kind of clinical designation for uh, a certain type of, um, uh, I guess, subject-object relationship, a certain type, type of content. I've identified that with uh, textual literature, that is a literature which uh, sort of systematically um, uh, abandons representation uh, and um, uh, abandons uh, narrative and uh, takes as its model, um, let's say, or as its aesthetic, something like the Mobius Strip, where um, uh, you know what a Mobius Strip is. It's, uh, picture of it or something. It's a, um, it's a strip, let's take a, take a band of ribbon like this, where the two ends are connected backwards. So that you begin, uh, and then you travel around, and you never meet the point that you begin on, because uh, you're on the other side of the band. So it's a kind of closure. Uh, it's, uh, it's a closed circuit, which is infinite, uh, and which uh, therefore uh, somehow takes off, uh, to, to, to drop back into a different terminology, which is a, uh, a sign system in which little by little uh, the signifiers begin to generate themselves and uh, take off from their signifieds and follow a kind of autonomous logic of their own so that where you, you begin thinking that you're in a world of representation, uh, and you end up being in a world of sentences without having been able to make the, uh, uh, the transition. Uh, I guess the, uh, the, the, the examples of that in Beckett, the most dramatic ones are more in, um, well, the, uh, the, um, those of you who listened to Umberto Eco's uh, lecture about this little anecdote of, um, of Alphonse Allais uh, ha have heard a, a kind of basic um, uh, example of this Mobius strip kind of, uh, kind of thing. That's a, the anecdote was, uh, I think, uh, was interesting because it was not really uh, language conscious at all in, in, a, in any kind of modern or postmodern sense. But what happened was that under the very force of the narrative, under, under some kind of strange internal logic of this narrative, uh, we reached a point where uh, the characters of the narrative were only words and not characters. And therefore, you get this kind of final revelation in which um, the hero unmasks the heroine. It's a, remember that it's a drama of jealousy and uh, he's surprising her, trying to go out with someone else at a masked ball. And, and at the end, uh, he, uh, he rips the mask from her face and Ale tells us, uh, it was not Marguerite, that is the heroine. She takes the mask off, off his face and it was not Raoul. It wasn't the hero. So who was it? So you're you're in a you're in a uh, um, a, a wor in a world which in which though even those signifiers which were originally part of the representational narrative have disappeared. The other example like that it, uh, is um, uh, is in UNESCO's plays. If you know the Bald Soprano, uh, you remember how uh, you have a whole series of uh, of games about this Mr. and Mrs. Uh, not Mr. Bobby and Mrs. Watson. Smith, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, huh? Bobby oh, the, Bobby, the Bobby Watsons, that's right. No, I don't mean Bobby Watson the mother, but Bobby Watson the father. No, no, the, the, the first cousin, Bobby Watson, who married his uh, second cousin, uh, Bobby Watson, and so on and so on. Uh, or the, uh, the, the other couple who find out, um, haven't they seen each other before? Yes, uh, we'd, isn't that uh, odd? Uh, yeah, we, were bo we both took the same train down uh, to London, and we both uh, live in the same street, and uh, isn't this odd, peculiar, what, what a coincidence? and so forth. And, um, so these are all, I think, dramatizations of this uh, new, uh, uh, what I'm calling this Mobius strip um, uh, uh, potentiality of, uh, of language to autonomize itself and to create uh, a, a surface which is independent then of, uh, of a logic of signifieds um, uh, and which then one can call 
for want of a better term, uh, a, a, a textual literature, a literature of textualization, a literature of texts rather than narratives, rather than works of art, rather than novels. Um, Okay, finally, um, uh, I've tended to identify schizophrenic literature, textual literature, and something that people now call postmodernism, which I guess uh, envelops uh, conceptual art, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, photorealism, hyperrealism, things like that. Um, uh, John Cage, uh, uh, new music of that, uh, of that kind, what else? Uh, where uh, it's understood that um, it, it's felt, uh, and I, this is something that I'm not really competent to, to go into and that we don't have materials to, to deal with, but it's uh, somehow everyone feels, I think, and this is the starting point for this idea, that this is not the same as the classical modern tradition. Uh, that is, uh, John Cage is radically different from Schoenberg. And uh, how does one, how is one to, how is one to account for this? That in Schoenberg, there's still the notion of the work of art, of form. Uh, we're in Cage, uh, there isn't any more. Uh, if you like, have I quoted Deleuze on philosophy books to you? He says, um, uh, I, this Andy Oedipus, he says, this is not a system. I'm not writing a philosophy book of the old kind anymore. Uh, there isn't a, uh, there isn't, this is, you're supposed to read this book the way you listen to a record. Uh, we want to, all we want to do is write books now. We don't want to, we don't want to create philosophical systems. Uh, well, in a sense, all of postmodernism is that. You react to it the way you listen to a record. That is to say, um, uh, you listen to it for as long as you want to, and then you do something else. Or, uh, there's a wholly different relationship between the spectator and this flow of things, or this uh, set of things, than there is to um, this difficult, uh, complicated work that makes demands on you that you have to concentrate on uh, and master and, uh, um, and all the rest of it. Uh, so um, the, the, the general problem that I'm trying to raise uh, and that I, that I put in the form of a problem rather than identification is, uh, are these three things um, analogous or the same? Uh, are they, and can one from them, uh, can one uh, go further and periodize this, uh, this transformation. Presumably, uh, something else that goes along with it is, um, uh, is structuralism itself uh, as, a, uh, as, a, um, uh, as an awareness of the, the primacy of language, uh, which is not, not really, well, uh, in that form, not doesn't really characterize the 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 the, the thought of, of modernism. The thought of modernism is rather, uh, I guess, uh, uh, of classical modernism is rather uh, uh, existential thought, reflection on time, uh, on freedom, death, anxiety, and things like that. Uh, uh, if if you take uh, Husserl or Heidegger or, or Nietzsche as, as, uh, as uh, contemporaneous with, with classical modernism. So this, this corresponds then to a philosophical permutation where all of these issues are thrown onto the realm of language, which is not an object of the same kind. Um, is one entitled then to speak, to, to talk about a period, to talk about a postmodern period, to talk about a radical break? Uh, and if so, then where does, uh, because it's obvious to what this corresponds socially, uh, it corresponds to the emergence of, um, uh, of something that's called by a whole lot of different names, consumer society, media society, uh, post-industrial society, um, the, to the cybernetic revolution, uh, the, the new sort of post-war uh, post, uh, uh, post system of the multinationals and, and all the rest of this. Now, uh, you understand what's at stake in this uh, for a certain Marxist tradition. Um, this, is a, um, this, is a, this is a suspect idea because it comes from, uh, because it's very closely allied to people who want to liquidate uh, the, uh, the, the Marxist diagnosis of capitalism and suggest that really capitalism has itself turned into something else. Uh, it's no accident that the term post-industrial society is that of Daniel Bell. Uh, and uh, so this, in, in a sense, uh, this, um, uh, 
this kind of notion of a, uh, of a radical break is congenial to the apologists of capitalism who want to show that uh, the things that uh, Marx described and analyzed as a diagnosis of classical capitalism substantially no longer obtain today because we're in a wholly different uh, thing. We're in a different mutation of the system. Uh, now, uh, I, I, I understand this, uh, this danger. Um, it seems to me that it's clear that Marxism itself makes, makes some basic uh, periodizations, that is, distinguishes between national capitalism, the imperialist moment, uh, and has to obviously come to terms with, uh, with uh, what's going on at present, which is somehow, uh, if it's still imperialism, then we still got to find a, a, um, a, a, a term to underscore the difference between this kind of uh, neocolonialism and, and sort of total systematization from which even the Eastern countries aren't exempt, uh, and uh, the kind of thing that you had around the time of the First World War, which is a very different kind of control and a very different kind of penetration. So it seems to me that some, some, some such kind of periodization uh, has, to be, um, has to be made. And I think uh, the, the other reason why um, a, a supplementary language has to be de de uh, devised uh, for, for this phenomenon is, uh, is a rhetorical one, namely that um, people don't, um, that even though uh, the, the language of classical Marxism remains uh, true and has a referent, uh, that is, there are classes uh, and, uh, uh, and there is a falling rate of profit and all the rest of it, um, this language is not perceived by people in the first world uh, as having any content anymore, or rather uh, it's a language which is, uh, which, to which people shut off their hearing aids in much the same way uh, that uh, it's a language which is contemporary, contemporaneous with the discourse of realism. Uh, and as such, uh, it is felt to be old-fashioned and, um, uh, and banal, and, uh, and, it doesn't, uh, and, and it doesn't do justice to the existential realities of people's lives, even though, uh, in my opinion, it, it continues to do justice to the objective situation that they find themselves in. So I think um, even Marxism has to uh, uh, come to terms with uh, a situation in which, which is analogous to that of artistic discourse, in which um, uh, modernism is not a, uh, a, a move away from realism, but is a repression of realism. That is, uh, my thesis uh, in some of the earlier analyses that we've, uh, that we've undertaken is that um, uh, modernism contains realism within itself in a, uh, in a, in a way that's canceled and uh, sublated, if you like, that kind of Hegelian language. Uh, and uh, by the same token, it seems to me that consumer society, and the language one would use to describe consumer society, contains classical capitalism within itself, but, but uh, canceled in some sense. Uh, that is, all the realities are there, but and our feet move around in that world, but our heads aren't in that world, and it's very difficult for us to make these uh, uh, to, to make these um, uh, to make these connections. Okay, now uh, I want to um, uh, I want to deal with um, Beckett in something of this framework as a as a prime exhibit of, uh, of what's going on in, in, uh, in this postmodernism, it always being understood that I leave this um, open, really, this, this question of, I mean, I, I, it, for me, it's a, it's a matter of a problem to be worked on rather than a, uh, rather than a proposition that I'm, uh, that I'm stating as, as such. Uh, okay, now let me retrace my steps a little bit to um, uh, to the framework we were looking at Beckett in last time. Uh, it seemed to me there were two matters that had come up uh, already. Uh, one is the question of bad writing. Uh, you see, I think there's a book by, um, <coughs> by Joe Riddle on William Carlos Williams, which I think has the subtitle, The Poetics of Failure. Um, now, I think that's a very interesting idea, but one has to be consequent with it. If you think that it's a failure, uh, one, it, one can't let it be recuperated in some way, and it's very hard if one wants to talk about Beckett as the failure of a certain literature. Um, 
since you have the Nobel Prize and consecration and all the rest of it, and, and Beckett's canonization in the literary, um, uh, in the uh, in in the uh, in the canon, uh, as a as a new kind of sacred text or as a kind of dominant text of of, uh, of the literature that we read. Um, it's very difficult to square those two things. That is very difficult to work one's way back through that transformation of Beckett into a literary institution uh, to the point where one can really see uh, what's going on in some um, in some uh, radically different sense. But um, uh, but I think uh, we have to. Uh, I, I think we can see more things about Beckett if we understand it as a failure than if we understand it as a. As, as a success, uh, but all the writers that we've read are, in a sense, um, have a certain kind of bad writing as uh, one uh, limit or, uh, or a moment of their work. Um, Conrad's bad writing is, of course, uh, the lapse into the worst kind of romance, um, uh, r romance narrative. Uh, and I don't know if you've read any of the bad books of Conrad. Uh, they, I don't know what the, the, the break is, uh, not too long after Nostromo, I think. Um, but all the later things are just uh, execrable and, and uh, um, either bad Henry James or much worse, uh, bad uh, Stevenson or something like that. Uh, full of very romantic gestures, and, and but something that we've already seen emerging at the end of Lord Jim, in the second part of Lord Jim. I don't, again, want to. I want to be somewhat measured about that, but it seems to me that the this impulse of of to do a degraded, um, uh, 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 to 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 use a kind of degraded, uh, embellished uh, art discourse uh, or uh, or um, uh, kitsch discourse is. Uh, is already present there. Now, uh, in Lewis and Beckett, uh, on the contrary, that isn't the kind of bad writing that uh, lies in wait for them. Uh, rather, uh, what happens to them, it seems to me, is something that I guess one has to call doodling or something. That is, uh, it's this business of uh, blackening pages where uh, suddenly you, you start to describe and then you describe everything in minute detail and it could, could go on for for forever, and uh, the reader gets nervous, and so on. And and uh, it's um, I don't know if you know the remark that uh, Truman Capote is supposed to have said when he read uh, Kerouac's On the Road in in uh, in manuscript for the first time. He said, uh, "That's not writing. That's typing." Uh, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> that's that's sort of what one could say about um, about these pages of. Uh, of either Lewis or, or Beckett, that uh, you, something is going on there which is not writing anymore, but which is, if not typing, then at least uh, uh, at, at least uh, écriture in a in a in a less positive uh, uh, in a less positive sense. Um, now, uh, I think we want to find out uh, why this uh, takes place, uh, what it corresponds to. Um, uh, obviously, the result of this will be that there's a displacement of the, it, it, the, this becomes motivated in the Russian formalist use of the term motivation. That is, that's uh, uh, in artistic composition when you have to do something, you have to, well, you've got to, you're, you have a set of people on stage. You've got to get one of them off and you've got to get a message on. That's a plot necessity. So then you figure out uh, all kinds of supplementary reasons why uh, uh, to explain that. Well, that would be a kind of, uh, that's a kind of primary form of motivation. Here in Beckett, um, if one has to blacken pages, if one has to doodle, uh, then um, little by little, uh, uh, there uh, comes to be felt the need for a kind of aesthetic motivation of that. That is, you want to readjust the aesthetic of the work in such a way that now for the reader, it is, this is felt to be desirable. Well, this happens in Beckett by the gradual emergence of the whole theme, if you like, of writing as such. You remember that the dominant, um, the dominant, um, it's not an image, uh, concept of the, uh, of the three novels of the so-called uh, uh, trilogy, uh, as far as writing is concerned, is that of the pensum. Uh, I don't think that's an English word, is it? But uh, what it means is, is it? Huh? No. Is it? I thought it was French. 
Well, is it is it English? In other words, it's uh, what's it mean then? Well, yeah, I, but this is something that you actually used in school. Uh, so that's not it's not familiar to me, huh? Uh, well, as I understand it, it's when you're told uh, write your name forty-five times. It's a it, it, it's a writing task that one is given. Uh, write this sentence twenty-five times or, or whatever. Uh, it's a chore, a written chore that one is given, uh, which doesn't involve, I think. Um, Originality, that is, you're not told to do a paper on something, but it's, but it's a mechanical uh, going through and pr production of sentences. Well, this becomes the figure for uh, all of later Beckett. Well, you understand then that if uh, the aesthetic is now organized around the pensum, then uh, the, uh, the fact of doodling, uh, far from being failure, then becomes exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be doodling. That's what you've been told to do. Fill up black in these pages. Uh, fill up all these pages. And, and so little by little, the whole thing uh, is readjust. And, and in fact, what happens is, of course, that suddenly all that doodling is filled with content now again. Uh, where in what uh, uh, it wasn't, or if you like, I don't, you know, I don't, I want uh, it to be understood that all this stuff is funny in Watt, and, and uh, Beckett is a comic writer, and there is a whole, um, uh, this is all uh, in a tradition of the plays of, of uh, Keystone Cops and stuff, and, and uh, uh, or minstrel shows or whatever, uh, and certainly uh, the things in Watt are um, uh, are funny too, but I think that's not that that's a secondary effect to, to what I'm talking about. Um, at any rate, uh, that's the first thing that we want to try to uh, account for in Beckett, bad writing. And the second thing I think would be uh, this, uh, why, um, why it is that this is not just simply existentialism. Uh, because it would seem as though it ought to be. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that one can use Watt for uh, is for evidence uh, as to um, the, the rate of, of decoding uh, going on in, um, uh, uh, at, at this stage in, uh, in literary production. Uh, you remember um, that uh, as, we, as, we've, uh, as I've been reading uh, the notion of decoding, uh, following, as I said yesterday, uh, I've been sort of plugging it back into the dialectic of enlightenment, uh, it seems to me that there's a first negative phase of decoding, which is, however, uh, positive in its results. That is, uh, the, uh, the operation of, uh, it's an enlightenment operation. Uh, and essentially, decoding means doing away with the apparatus of the sacred, um, doing away with uh, hierarchy, doing away with religion. Uh, doing away with the traditional, in Weber's sense, um, uh, corrosively analyzing all of this, this whole ancien regime structure, uh, which, uh, which is inherited by capitalism, and which it's the task of science uh, to, um, to eliminate. Uh, so you work your way back to a kind of uh, system which can be completely rationalized, uh, in which um, uh, people are uh, rigorously identical, in which products are rigorously identical, that's what money means essentially, that is in which there's one, uh, one uh, abstract medium in terms of which one can understand all objects, including people, because then people uh, sell their labor power and so on, and the whole notion of labor power is, is a similar abstraction, and so on and so forth. Okay, so decoding, works its way back through those things and, uh, and gets rid of all of, the, um, uh, all of the inherited forms which would have prevented the operation of this rigorously mechanical kind of uh, system. That is, going back to Deleuze, it destroys all of those codes and overcodes in order to prepare the axiomatic of the marketplace, let's say. But then uh, it goes even further. And at that point, it begins to undermine uh, its own results. It begins to undermine science itself. And then we arrive not at positivism, that is, as a, at, a, at, a, at a positive uh, ideology and philosophy of science and philosophy of the bourgeoisie, 
but a nihilism, an existentialism, which asserts the impossibility of any kind of philosophy, the impossibility of any kind of meaning, uh, and all the rest of it. And this is really part of the process of decoding. It's simply a continuation of it, but it's a moment in which decoding undermines it, undermines itself. Uh, <coughs> um, in, uh, in what, let's see. Um, uh, Watts in the house, remember, cleaning, doing things, and the piano tuners arrive. Um, uh, so, uh, well, they tune the piano and they leave. Um, in, in a sense, page 72, in a sense it resembled all the incidents of note proposed to Watt during his stay in Mr. Knott's house, and of which a certain number will be recorded in this place without addition or subtraction, and in a sense not. It resembled them in the sense that it was not ended when it was passed, but continued to unfold in Watt's head from beginning to end over and over again, the complex connections of its lights and shadows, the passing from silence to sound and from sound to silence, so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, gradually lost in the nice process of its light, its sound, its impacts, its rhythm, all meaning, even the most literal. Thus, the scene in the music room with the two Gauls ceased very soon to signify for what a piano tune, an obscure family and professional relation, an exchange of judgments more or less intelligible, and so on, if indeed it had ever signified such things, and became, became a mere example of light commenting bodies and stillness motion and silent sound and comment comment. Well, what you have there, in other words, is um, uh, you have a, a, an initial uh, um, uh, amount of data which is perceived in a uh, still in conventional social terms. Uh, these people have professions, uh, their class relations, uh, they have an economic relationship to uh, the people in the house and they're there for a certain purpose. And these, these, this content is then stripped. Uh, and little by little, uh, this scene is made more and more abstract uh, to the point when we pass through the impressionist phase that we talked about in Conrad, that is, uh, the first moment of abstraction is this moment of light and shadow where uh, uh, we've lost the sociological content, what one could call a concrete content. We have nothing but the visual or perceptible. But already in Beckett, we're beyond that. Beckett is not interested in pictures or anything. And, and the, uh, calling, talking about this in such abstract terms as light, uh, sound, stillness, and so on, is already to strip even the perceptual of its content, because uh, we're being told not that any, uh, that, that any particular sense datum is uh, of interest in its own right, but uh, that, uh, that the perceptual is itself a state. Finally, we reach uh, the, the moment uh, of the linguistic, uh, in which um, the whole thing turns back on itself, uh, and what we're looking at is no longer uh, the thing, but our own attempts to comment the thing and then to comment on our comments. So we're in the realm of, uh, of mental categories, if you like, rather than in a realm of, uh, of interpretation. This fragility of the outer meaning had a bad effect on Watt, for it caused him to seek for another, for some meaning of what had passed in the image of how it had passed. The most meager, the least plausible, would have satisfied Watt, who had not seen a symbol nor executed an interpretation since the age of 14 or 15, and who had lived miserably, it is true, among face values all his adult life, uh, face values at least for him. Okay, well, obviously, uh, one ties this up uh, with, um, uh, with uh, the, the, the uh, whole exegetic tradition that uh, uh, that you have enjoys to the formation of, of uh, uh, Irish uh, intellectuals in a, um, in a scholastic uh, tradition in which uh, one uh, in which the whole language and apparatus of textual interpretation is uh, is present so forth. But whereas in Joyce, uh, it would seem that that's still uh, that that's still alive. It seems to me that here uh, that's as distant from. Uh, from this text, as as the religious uh, as the religious content uh, uh, that we discussed last time, that is, uh, it's uh, it's here uh, in, in in the text, but it's dead. It's simply a, uh, I don't know whether one wants to call out a presence anymore. It's simply uh, an inert element 
of the situation. It's an object like everything else in, in, in these works. So we have uh, exegetical apparatus, but that's there like the stones, like the furniture in the room, like uh, what Christ said to the two thieves, and all of those things are uh, rigorously separable from each other and can't really be, uh, can't really be uh, uh, reconnected. Um, okay, uh, one could go on and show how, um, uh, well, here a little later, what was this pursuit of meaning in this indifference to meaning, and to what did it tend? These are delicate questions. For when Watt at last spoke of this time, it was a time, uh, time long past, and of which his recollections were, in a sense, perhaps less clear than he would have wished, though too clear for his liking in another. Uh, and so on and so on. Uh, there's a whole um, theme here of, um, of interpretation, meaninglessness, uh, this empty <clears throat> operation of the mind, which is going on gnawing at, uh, at, its, uh, at its raw materials as though it could extract some, um, some uh, meaning, some interpretation from them but in a way that's somehow purely mechanical, that is, um, uh, which is a little bit, um, uh, which it seems to me is to be ranged among the compulsive things that these characters do with their objects. Again, the stones in, in Malloy are the most uh, striking example of that. Uh, but also, uh, what you do, how many ways you can walk across a room in, uh, in the description of Mr. Knott's uh, life up, upstairs. Uh, you can walk from the window to the door, from the door to the window, around the door and towards the window, towards the door and around the, and so on and so on for, for several pages. Uh, well, this is all, it seems to me, um, uh, if, if you want to put it in a clinical context, uh, that of last week, it seems to me that this is what the mind uh, does with things in this um, abstracted state that Lentz was in where uh, it doesn't think of anything. That is, um, uh, there is nothing natural to be done with these objects. Um, ideally, at that point, the mind should simply uh, eclipse itself for a while because it's got nothing to think, uh, it's got nothing to do, uh, it's got nothing to feel, but it doesn't. It, it goes on being conscious, so what is, it, what is it supposed to do during that time? Well, it sort of mechanically straightens things the way people have compulsions to straighten, straighten their desks or, or whatever. And this is all, it seems to me, uh, these various types of things that the subject does with its object in, in Beckett uh, are so many, uh, so many examples of that, um, uh, of that process. So, um, so this... Uh, is it seems to me a, a, a different um, a, a, a different moment from the existential moment in that um, uh, existentialism has, wants to really raise seriously the issue of what you do when you get to a kind of rock bottom of decoding. What happens when you decode to the point where what's left is this, you know, in the, the, the in the Hindu parable, the, the, this uh, empty hollow at the core of the onion that was supposed to be, uh, that was supposed to be the, the ultimate uh, revelation. What do you do when, uh, when you dismantle an act or a feeling or something and you find, as in Conrad, that there's nothing at the center of it, that is the freedom is, is, uh, is a leap or something like that? Uh, well, it, it seems to me that Beckett is beyond that. That is, the, the, the mode of questioning looks the same, uh, and it looks as though uh, the, the the emotions are analogous, that is, a life is nothing but a waiting, uh, um, uh, it's empty, uh, death is at the end of it, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, but, uh, but somehow that doesn't have the same, uh, seems to me that doesn't have the same um, ring at all. This is not a meditation on time, uh, as is the case with Heidegger or Sartre or, or whatever, uh, but it is uh, a meditation on um, it, it, more of a meditation on writing and what writing is, that writing is both going somewhere in time and not going anywhere in time, uh, and writing becomes the, 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 the figure for this. So, um, so we want to see if we can um, evaluate and describe this a little more, uh, in a little more detail. Okay, now, let me... Um, uh, remind you, uh, well, let, let me first uh, talk about this in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, um, uh, 
re the, the realistic content that's being, that's being repressed here. Um, uh, we're, in the model we're trying to make, uh, to, 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 to project is something like this, that uh, you have a, uh, a kind of uh, decoded discourse, which is that of realism, which is that of the, the invention and the projection of the world of daily life of capital, of the world of daily life of the market. Uh, at a certain point, uh, this decoded reality, both in art and in life, because this is overdetermined and this is a process which is taking place uh, in uh, the history of forms, but also in the evolution of social life, uh, this decoding uh, becomes intolerable. That is to say, uh, uh, to, to talk in existential terms or social terms, uh, the, the market so dehumanizes people's lives that uh, it, it no longer, this everyday life of, of capital becomes uh, uh, um, somehow completely uh, empty of, of satisfaction and, and meaning and all the rest. Or on the level of form, one can say, one can talk about um, something like uh, a, an exhaustion of raw material. That is, uh, at a certain point, um, the, the, the realists moved into various realities of, of, uh, of, of social life. Uh, and as they did so, they made it impossible for the next generation of novelists to deal with that material. Uh, so that had to be presupposed uh, so uh, let's say Flaubert is presupposed in Zola, but then after Zola, you can't do those things anymore, and you have to little by little find increasingly uh, specialized areas that weren't covered by this kind of discourse. And there's a way in which um, the very fact of exposure to artistic discourse um, is uh, is a mode of colonization. That is, um, uh, it seems to me that. Um, Precisely uh, the, the kinds of art that uh, art languages that we're interested in today are those uh, which deal with things that um, have not had access to language before. Uh, so, for example, uh, but, but this changes very fast, obviously. So, for example, black literature in the sense that the black experience was not one which was seen by anybody or spoken by anybody. So, for a while, that's still fresh, or women's literature or third world literature, or gay literature, or whatever. These are all areas which, for the moment, uh, had, had this is, these are raw materials which, which were uncolonized. Uh, and so uh, about these things, a kind of realism can still be um, produced, which cannot be produced about uh, establishment middle class life anymore, because that, all of those, that material has been told over and over again uh, all the way back to, uh, to the beginnings of the 19th century and is now, uh, and those descriptions, as I said about Marxism a moment ago, those descriptions are still true, but they're boring. Nobody, uh, nobody's interested in those things anymore, whether they're objective or not. So uh, in these two ways, on the level of social life and on the level of form, uh, decoding reaches a moment which is somehow felt to be intolerable, and to which the answer becomes then, uh, and this is the point where I think there may be more possibilities than, than Deleuze, uh, uh, but this is, this is re-implied in what he says, um, uh, reaches a point when uh, the, the solution becomes recoding. Uh, this is the moment which I call out of modernism, and you understand this is not chronological. I mean, you have recoding already with the Romantics, so it's, we're not talking about a, a set of events, but rather, synchronous tendencies. Um, recoding means taking up this decoded material and trying to make a real, taking up this dead axiomatic and trying to make uh, an old-fashioned code back out of it. Uh, if you like, this is, this is something which is known in Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, criticism in a different kind of language. They talk about, uh, oh, the death of God, the nostalgia of religion, all that, all that kind of thing. I think that's the wrong, those are the wrong terms to talk about this in. But certainly, uh, if you talk about religious revivals, you're talking about recoding. You're talking about uh, the sense of the disappearance of meaning and then the attempt artificially to pump meaning back into those things. Uh, now, I think the point about recoding is that um, uh, 
it has to be understood as an artificial thing. The primitive masks that you find in Picasso are not coding, are not savagery, are not primitive art. Uh, on, the, on the contrary, they're a form of recoding and they're uh, a kind of uh, invention of, uh, uh, of uh, free invention of, um, of, of, of style uh, in, a, um, in, a, in a fragmented world, which is itself a kind of refusal of representational forms and so on and so forth, a repression of, of, uh, of a kind of realistic um, realistic discourse. So this is the moment that I'd like to characterize by being that of the invention of private languages, because it seems to me that, this, uh, that the great modernisms are all characterized in that way. How does one, what, is, what does one do, what is, how does one describe a private language? Well, I, I think uh, I don't have all the elements of an answer to that, but I think uh, we're doing something analogous uh, in the way we deal with these theories, and they might be a way of understanding how we do it. Um, here, you know, a few weeks ago, we weren't using these terms, coding, overcoding, and so on. Now, all of a sudden, we have this new set of terms. Um, do they correspond to a brand new idea about things? Not exactly. I think they offer simply a new grid. Uh, which we learn, first of all, as we learn all these positions, and then we transcode all of the things we know already into this new kind of discourse. And we rewrite all of the stuff that we already know about literary history uh, in these terms, and we see uh, what that does to what we know and how that reorganizes things. And it seems to me that something like that uh, characterizes the production of a private language. Now, this is going on in the great modern writers, too. Uh, there's a marvelous passage of Proust that talks about this, which I ought to really have handy to read to you. I don't know, uh, somewhere. Oh, it's later on in, in uh, Cher. She's talking about the, his first reading, in fact, of Claudel's uh, saint uh, and he says, when one has the shock of, um, uh, of, of a brand new thing like this, and something which is enormously great, one doesn't know it right away. Uh, all you know is that it's not right. It's, uh, it, it doesn't fit into what you know. It, it's a language which is it's not, a, it's not yet a language for you. All you register is that uh, this is aberrant with respect to the art languages you know already. So then, but you're fascinated by this apparent dissonance. It's not bad either, it's just different. Um, your process of understanding Claudel or whoever, Proust himself, if you like, because then he's talking about your reaction to him, is to read this until little by little you learn this new language. Uh, and then at that point, uh, it becomes uh, uh, domesticated. That is, you don't, you don't re-adapt uh, re uh, it to everything else you know. It becomes yet a new language in terms of which you begin to uh, recode your own existential experience, since that's what happens in a work of art. Well, it seems to me that all of that's involved. That is, you, as you read, um, uh, let's say you read Lawrence for the first time and you have no reaction. Later on, you read uh, some of those things and you get to understand the system a little bit better. And then you say, uh-huh, this is what, uh, this experience in my own life is what's being um, indicated or uh, is what's at stake in this, uh, in this work of Lawrence. Now, uh, what that means, I think, essentially, in the terms we're talking about it, is that you rewrite your own life in terms of this new sign system, essentially. And so your process of using Lawrence uh, and of exploring this particular world is one of, um, of uh, rewriting your own materials in, in terms of this. And to that degree, uh, these various uh, types of recoding become so many um, uh, become so many private religions, if you like. Uh, that is, in that sense, they do uh, each one um, perform the function of religion, which is to to uh, create a, a a universal language in terms of which everybody can code their own experiences. Um, but of course. Uh, there's, there's a fundamental contradiction because these are private religions and private languages. And so, uh, first of all, they have no institutional uh, consensus, um, although then the university uh, undertakes somehow to put all these things together into some kind of uh, 
uh, synthetic amalgam of, of great modernisms, which, uh, which little by little we're uh, supposed to um, practice as a kind of, uh, uh, as a kind of uh, super code that we understand uh, uh, literature in terms of. But what that does is simply to empty all these things of their, uh, of their meaning. Uh, there's a still very important essay by Lionel Trilling called Beyond Culture, where he talks about that, that uh, the price of the institutionalization of all these things is that they lose, uh, all of them wanted to be, Lawrence, uh, all the rest of it, uh, wanted to be profoundly subversive kinds of discourse, and suddenly they become uh, a kind of establishment, um, uh, kind of establishment uh, set of languages, art languages in their own uh, in their own right. Um, and of course, in one's own uh, experience, what happens is simply that you, how do you come to terms with a whole series of them? That is, um, it's fine to convert to this writer or to that writer, but uh, everybody when you read modern literature, you have sort of multiple conversions. Well, then what do you do? What do you do with Faulkner during your pound period? Or what do you do with, um, what do you do with Bernanos during your Beckett period or whatever? I mean, so, 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 there's, so there's dynamics in one's own, um, in one's own uh, um, uh, uh, relationship to, to these private languages, which are also, um, which are, uh, um, uh, which also tend to undermine the, the, the process itself. Now, it's clear that something like this is now happening in philosophy. That is, uh, philosophy is now uh, so many private languages of the same type. There are various, again, various explanations of this. Um, uh, Baudrillard's uh, model of it is that uh, we're entering on a period where signifiers sort of generate themselves. Uh, and so where uh, the theories that we have now are theories about theories rather than theories about signifieds or uh, things that you used to take as, uh, as realities. Um, uh, the Deleuze uh, version of this would seem to be, um, if I understand this part of their, uh, their chapter on savagery, barbarism, civilization correctly, uh, they would tend to interpret this in terms of the falling rate of profit. Uh, that is to say that uh, there is really a, a tendency in the very organization of capital which undermines itself uh, and which then reproduces itself, uh, I'm extrapolating that their theory to Baudrillard's theory, which reproduces itself in the cultural realm where uh, these new commodities which are the private languages are little by little uh, themselves, uh, first of all they rotate faster and faster, you have to have new ones all the time and this is a this is an irreversible process. Uh, and second, they begin to empty of their value and they, they're worth less and less and uh, they have less and less um, uh, durability and, and all the rest of it. Um, uh, and, and then finally, one can talk about uh, saturation, of, uh, of, uh, saturation by information. That is, uh, our environment is now uh, not uh, an environment that's poor in information as was the case with the first realisms where in Balzac, uh, clearly you got a, a huge field for, um, for what I called a moment ago colonization. That is, you have an Im immense mass of, of data which has not been spoken about, which has not been transformed into information, which doesn't yet I exist in a, in a cybernetic state. Uh, uh, Balzac uh, is, is, uh, has the good luck to be writing about, oh, you know, printing presses at a moment when you can't, uh, it, when, when you want to know realities about things, let's say uh, you're curious about some of the things that Balzac uh, is also curious about, printing presses, uh, how f high finance functions, banks, uh, um, uh, d diplomatic uh, mechanisms and things like that. Well, today we don't go to a novel. Uh, we know that there are books in the library which are supposed to be manuals which describe these things and where we can get the referential truth about this stuff. That is, our, uh, our environment is saturated by information, stored information about all these things. Balzac, however, writes about printing presses or high finance uh, at a time when there are no books on those subjects. He's writing the books on those subjects. He's both a sociologist and a novelist, and so he's dealing with something which can seem to be purely referential in that there doesn't yet exist languages about those things and there doesn't yet exist writing about, uh, about those objects. Well, obviously, that makes for a very different discursive stance 
than today when um, everybody, no matter how much they'd like to be writing and talking about reality, uh, has to end up one way or another being aware that they're talking about more talk or commenting about more comment, as Beckett says, or to use uh, Baudrillard, uh, the, the, the Deleuze um, characterization, which is, really comes out of Baudrillard and out of Guy Debord, uh, that the, what looks like realities in our society are really images, uh, which are another form of information. That is, uh, we, don't, we think we're touching things, but really we're only touching the images of things, the concepts of things, the words about things, the information about things. Um, and all the rest of it. So uh, all of these things, um, all of these things, uh, both account for modernism, but tend, uh, uh, in the long run, to, to undermine it. And the more successful it is, the more failure it is. Uh, that is, uh, it can survive modernism in a uh, in a situation in which it's um, uh, in which it is uh, oppositional uh, and marginal. Uh, but it can't survive in a situation in which it's the dominant language. Uh, so, um, uh, and you have to understand that economically modernism is the dominant language. That is, um, um, the the whole, all of the the, the, the production industries and in, uh, 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 are really based on uh, um, uh, uh, fashion, the design of objects, the design of advertising are all things which presuppose all of the experiments of the great modernists in, uh, in, in, in the fine arts and also in, in literature as far as uh, advertising has verbal components and so on and so forth, TV, uh, TV advertising and all alike. So, um, so now from having been a, an oppositional culture uh, which was contestatory of the business order and business civilization and which refused business civilization, modernism has become the fundamental um, uh, cultural language necessary for the production of commodities and, uh, and of business. So there's a fundamental shift uh, there, too, in, uh, in the value that, that the various modernisms can have. OK, um, now Beckett, uh, what Beckett then represents uh, is, is yet another stage of this process. We have coding. We have, we have uh, recoding. And now uh, what's going to happen is that the recoding, I don't know, I haven't invented a good word for this yet, but that the recoding gets decoded in its turn. Uh, and we have a kind of art which lives off um, the uh, corrosive analysis of private languages themselves. This is a different kind of, um, this is a different kind of decoding than the classical realist one. Because the classical realist decoding took as its object uh, the world of, um, of, uh, uh, of inherited values. Uh, it took as its object the world of overcoding, the world of, of religion, uh, of hierarchy, of the sacred, and was a desacralization and a kind of scientific enlightenment critique of all of those things. Now we're on a different level. We're not decoding those realities, which are social realities, too. That is, they're the realities of, of the caste system. They're, the, they're, 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 uh, and their, their fundamental thrust is to destroy the, the whole pretensions of the aristocracy to a, to a privileged caste position and so on. Uh, but rather, uh, these things now take place almost completely within the world of culture, where they are the unraveling uh, of the very categories which are operative during the recoding process. And it's in that sense that, they be, that, they are, that one can talk about a kind of conceptual art. That is, um, um, I don't know if conceptual art is, a, is, is something that uh, <coughs> people here uh, have, uh, have had some experience of. I guess I would like to, we've talked a little bit about Magritte, um, uh, that's not yet conceptual art, but there are enough of a similarity to make that a, a kind of useful way of, um, of, uh, of maybe talking about it. Uh, you, can, you can begin to see what's meant by that in Magritte, where um, you realize, uh, oh, take, for example, this, um, there's a painting, don't know what it's called. Uh, you have a, a window which gives out on a scene. It's probably a cityscape, probably Paris, I guess, view of the Louvre, I don't know. 
to the window. But then, as you look, you understand that the window is framed in a picture frame, and in front of the window is standing an easel. And so you're looking at maybe not the window and not the view from the window, but the view in the picture. And these things are the same, and you don't know what you're looking at, and so on. Well, there's a kind of um, perceptual short circuit that takes place in which um, you're projected not onto the plane of interpretation, which is the case in classical surrealism. That is, it seems to me, in Dali, you're immediately fed back into Dali's private language. Uh, or in Chagall, or in, uh, who else? I don't know, Max Ernst is a little bit different. But um, here, uh, we're not, uh, we don't move back into a sense of the world of Magritte, that is, Magritte's private symbols or anything. On the contrary, the, our very experience of this thing is short-circuited, and suddenly we find that instead of looking through the, the, the pane of glass, uh, we're looking at the pane of glass. That is, we're suddenly looking not at a perception, not at the content of a perception, but at the categories which are at work when we perceive. Uh, and this is not, and, but this is not, this sounds sort of like a moment of self-consciousness or reflexivity. It's more complicated than that because these are contradictory categories. That is, uh, we don't know what to do with this. I mean, it's a, it's a, there's a kind of double bind in, involved in this in this perception. It's not a, it's not a calm, sort of peaceful Hegelian uh, coming to consciousness of how you're thinking about what you're thinking and arriving at absolute spirit or something. On the contrary, it's a, um, it's a kind of shock in which the mind suddenly finds itself in a corner, boxed in. We're looking, but we're not supposed to be looking. We're perceiving representationally, but there is no representation, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and this is felt to be a kind of uh, paradox. What well, seems to me that this um, coming to consciousness of the categories of perception uh, is, uh, is the form that's taken by the disintegration of these private languages in postmodernism, or in the schizophrenic text, or in a textualization. Now, I, haven't, I don't want to lose from sight this, these elements of, po of modernism and postmodernism, which are the repression of realism. It seems to me that that's a kind of essential thing that we have to look at in Beckett before we go on further in, in this. Um, because if you look at Beckett, you see that uh, this is really, um, we have here uh, the impulse not only to um, to uh, Joycean modernism, but uh, to something much older, to kind of naturalistic writing. We have realistic uh, uh, ingredients here. We have, um, I don't quite know how to call this in the Irish situation, because both of these, both of these phenomena are uh, somewhat different from the classical continental versions in that we're dealing with a dependency country and a, and a, and a semi-peripheral colonized uh, country and not a and, and not a core country but uh, it would seem that the uh, that the social realities that we that we that are the immediate raw material of Beckett are either a kind of um, degraded Irish bourgeoisie or a kind of degraded Irish um, peasantry isn't the right word I guess yeomanry I don't know what one would call uh, call this uh, socially exactly but um, uh, but these are the these are the starting points. If you remember in Watt, the whole um, garbled story of Mr. Knockyball and uh, who is this aged peasant who's brought in? Uh, I forget how old he, he is, but he's the exhibit. Uh, he's he's remarkable because he can perform all kinds of complex um, mathematical operations in his mind at a moment. He's like a computer, and yet, in in every other way, he's just a kind of he's just your most traditional kind of aged Irish peasant. Well. It seems to me that he's he represents the very uh, the very contradiction in um, in Beckett's raw material. That is, we have a one and the same time uh, a, um, uh, a a social content which is so banal that it's been done already millions of times, uh, and that that's not what he wants to do. That is, Beckett is not a uh, a novelist about the Irish rural slum, uh, but why isn't he? Uh, why can't he be? I mean, it seems to me that that's where some of the mystery of Beckett's production is to be found. On the other hand, 
Beckett is also, so he is that. That's the, that's the identifiable content of these works. Yet, on the other hand, uh, uh, all of his production is completely abstract. That is, the mathematical operations are, it seems to me, simply a figure for this reflexive abstraction we spoke about a moment ago, this sort of work on, on the pure categories of narrative, which is at work in, in Beckett. And we have these two ends, which are a mystery, which, are, uh, which combine in this work, uh, but which one doesn't know what to do, to, to do with. Um, and so then you submit them to judgment and you, uh, you, uh, uh, you have them narrate their story and then you question them and so on. And, and there's produced a situation that we'll look at in a, in a moment. I guess the most beautiful, uh, because I think there is this part of Beckett, the most beautiful um, uh, example of this whole, this material of the urban, of the rural slum is, um, is found not in, uh, not in uh, Malloy or in Watt, but in uh, Malone Dyes. Uh, the Lamberts or the Lambert family. Um, um, he's walking outside. This is a it's humble presence, but oh, how useful! And this oh, so delicate way of giving disarmed them too at the sight of the bowl of goat's milk, only half emptied or left untouched, and prevented them from regarding this as an affront in the way tradition required. But what, it, would have, it would appear on reflection that Sappho's departure can seldom have escaped them. For at the least movement within sight of their land, were it only that of a little birds alighting or taking to wing, they raised their heads and stared with wide eyes. And even on the road, of which segments were visible more than a mile away, nothing could happen without their knowledge. And they were able not only to identify all those who passed along it and whose remoteness reduced them to the size of a pin's head, but also to divine whence they were coming, whence they were going, and for what purpose. Then they cried the news to one another, for they often worked at great distance apart, or they exchanged signals, all erect and turned towards the event, for it was one, before bowing themselves down to the earth again. And at the first spell of rest taken in common about the table or elsewhere, each one gave his version of what had passed and listened to those of the others. And if at first they were not uh, in agreement, so on, so on. It was there, very, therefore difficult for Seppo to glide away unseen, even in the deep shadow of the trees that bordered the stream, even supposing him to have been capable of gliding, for his movements were rather those of one floundering in a quag. And all raised their heads and watched him as he went, and then looked at one another before stooping to the earth again. And on each face bent to the earth, there played perhaps a little smile, a little rictus rather, but without malice, each wondering perhaps that the others felt the same, same thing and making the resolve to ask them at their next meeting and so on. Well, this idea of the faces lifted up, this, the group of peasants looking and then, and then not looking again, and, and, and all looking up, looking up in the sky together and so on, it seems to me to be very striking and to be a part of Beckett, uh, which is not uh, normally, uh, uh, normally um, uh, noted as such, but which, is, uh, which are the remains of a, uh, of a kind of concrete uh, social content, a kind of realistic content in these, um, in these works. Now, the other, uh, the other content is, of course, the critique of the, of the miserabilism, I guess one would say, of the Irish bourgeoisie, and this you get most strongly in, uh, in the um, uh, Moran section of Malloy, the whole, the interview with the priest and the whole, uh, the, 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 the order of the house, the bourgeois household, and, and all of this, and I think uh, probably that's not necessary to, uh, to comment. Now, the point about this is that these stories are not, this is the raw material that's available. Uh, uh, outside of this, there's only marginality, and of course that's then, uh, we get that in, um, in Murphy, but uh, marginality doesn't uh, uh, somehow does not uh, take the, the form of protest as it does in, um, uh, in, in other literary versions of this, but rather uh, it seems to me moves in this direction that we've come to identify as, as schizophrenia. That is, instead of this becoming uh, a literature of uh, the protest of marginals, against the dominant, instead of taking, let's say, the Sartrean path of the, the path that Sartre describes for Genet, uh, the path that leads to uh, Fanon, uh, even to Foucault, to the whole, uh, to the whole notion of um, the various uh, marginals who are excluded from language 
seizing on language, seizing it back, uh, speaking in their own voice and so forth, uh, and a path which is sketched here in the sense that uh, then, then the Beckett, the privileged Beckett characters will become the excluded, will become uh, the, uh, the, the kind of lumpens of this rural slum, that is these, uh, these migrant uh, these migrant workers who have uh, who, who can't even find work, who are just sort of bumming around the, the, the bums of waiting for Godot, who have don't even remember time or space or whatever. Uh, instead of that taking on a um, uh, a, a kind of social uh, symbolism, uh, on the contrary, uh, it moves in a um, in a different direction, which we have still uh, which we have still to uh, uh, to, to describe. Um, now. Uh, if these then are the the ways in which um, uh, if, if if these things are the remnants of realism which is repressed uh, in Beckett, uh, then we have to find out what um, how these things are undone, what they uh, what they make way for, or what uh, what what happens to these to these various things. I think um, I want to. Focus on two um, on two examples of uh, two ways of describing this process of conceptualization of the decoding of recoding or, or whatever of this um, foregrounding of the categories of uh, of private languages rather than of their of their content. One is a um, is a notion, I, th I, I may have talked about this already, um, uh, is a notion that I derived from Sartre's book on the, on the imaginary, which I think uh, has not been widely enough um, appreciated or used. Uh, he calls it the analogon, and I just take that term over from French because it's jargon in French too, and I don't know quite how else to render it. What he means by analogon is uh, the material component uh, or the material um, equivalent within the work of the experience of the work. I don't know quite how to, um, how to convey that other than for me to, 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 to show you how I see that going on in Beckett. Uh, take, I, I think I said some of this last time, but let me say it again because I think this is a better way of of re recoding it, if you like. Um, this is a better code to use, this notion of the analogon. Um, one of the ways we can distinguish Beckett from uh, existentialism is that um, uh, in the existential works, uh, the whole notion of the emptiness of time, uh, the unjustifiability of existence, uh, uh, and so forth, uh, was uh, so to speak, the content of the work. Uh, and uh, the aesthetic of existential uh, literature was one of expression. That is, um, the existential writers, and now I'm thinking of Sartre primarily, have a certain experience, experience vécue, a certain lived, uh, lived experience, uh, which uh, they want to convey in the work with a certain commentary. And your, uh, your mode of reaction to that is one of recognition. That is, uh, Sartre describes or expresses his own s sense of uh, uh, the, the crisis of the, uh, of the personality, the, 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 uh, the way that anxiety breaks through the defenses of the personality. Uh, and leaves you facing kind of empty time, facing the unjustifiability of everything you're doing and so on. Um, and then as you read that, you have to bring yourself to that description, find parts of your own um, uh, experience, uh, and identify them with what Sartre describes. That is quite precisely what we said a moment ago. You rewrite yourself in terms of the Sartrean description. Now, uh, it seems that on the face of it, uh, what Beckett is talking about is not at all uh, uh, unlike this, uh, these, the, the, the content of Sartre's, uh, of Sartre's um, subjects. Uh, that is to say, um, the whole point about uh, one can 
One can certainly make a reading of either Malloy or, uh, or Waiting for Godot as being uh, this uh, account of, of an empty time that isn't going anywhere, that's going to end with death, that's uh, therefore in one sense a waiting for death, but, but, but in another sense not because death isn't a thing that you wait for. I mean, it doesn't, it, it isn't, has no, uh, it, it doesn't organize uh, your life the way some other form of waiting would and so on. Uh, but at any rate, one can, uh, one can also rewrite Beckett in terms of the Sartrean description. Now, the point about it is that, that, the, that the Beckett play is not based on an aesthetic of expression, uh, but rather on the production of an analogon. Uh, what Beckett does uh, in, uh, in his play uh, is, and I, as I say, I think we touched on this last time, is to set the, uh, the dialogue of the play up in such a way that you, your theatrical, your experience as a spectator is one of a certain type of waiting. That is, you have uh, shaggy dog stories, you have uh, anecdotes that are begun, dropped, picked up later, you're busy waiting for these things to be picked up again, and so on and so on. There's a, a determinate theatrical experience which is being built up. And this is, let's say, uh, if you like, a material experience. That is, you're really sitting there, you really are waiting for uh, the next shoe to drop, and so on. And so this is a concrete um, experience of yours, uh, and it's a concrete experience of a certain theatrical text. Now, uh, it's that experience which is the analogon of Beckett's theme. Uh, that is, that is the concrete object within your own experience of the text, which becomes not the symbol of what Beckett wants to say about time, but the, ve the, the, the material vehicle of it. Uh, or if you like, it becomes something like this material uh, interpretant that we talked about in, in connection with Foucault. It is a material thing. It's a concrete thing. Now you don't have to refer back to your own private life. All you have to do is refer to your experience of the play. Uh, and your concrete experience of time in the play becomes the material object in which the, this theme of a set of propositions about time and experience and so on gets concretized. So this, this use of the analogon uh, this use of a kind of um, uh, vehicle within the work of art is quite different from uh, some older appeal in Sartre, but also in Proust and anybody else, this older appeal to similar experience uh, of your own. Now, I don't mean that there, aren't, that there aren't analogies in modernism for the use of the analogon, but it seems to me that um, uh, those are secondary uh, there. The Proust is still expressive, whatever other, obviously, uh, in a way, there are a lot of ways in which the, the, the novel, uh, the, the experience of reading the novel reproduces what it's supposed to be about and so on and so forth. But it seems to me that the primary thrust of Proust is still um, an, exp uh, an, an expressionistic one in this aesthetic sense. That is, Proust is describing his own subjective experience and appealing to recognition uh, from, from the reader. Uh, and that's the dominant in his aesthetic. When we get uh, to this postmodernist stage, that can no longer be relied on for one thing because the public is so completely fragmented that you have no idea whether anybody has had the same experiences. That is, uh, uh, it, to, to appeal to a commonality of experience is still to be within a fairly um, closely knit uh, community in some way, but that's gone. Uh, so that can't be appealed to. So all you really have, all you can count on is the moment when the reader is reading the text. And so that's the moment that you have to work on the reader and produce an experience which he will then adapt in the form of the analogon to the, uh, to, to the content. Now, um, obviously then, in the novels, where we don't have the stage experience, the analogon becomes the writing process itself. You're reading, I'm writing. And the writing, the act of writing, becomes the analogon for uh, uh, what we've called the sort of existential uh, content. This is why, you see, for me, uh, uh, the textualization of the thing is not primary. Uh, what's primary, uh, that is, uh, this is not the ultimate 
unveiling of properties of language is going on. Rather, the, 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 the predominance of language, the foregrounding of text and of writing and so forth, uh, is simply another strategy of postmodernism, which is analogous to a whole set of them, because uh, in a way, I guess the, the, um, my framework is, is, uh, is in that sense not structural. I mean, for me, language isn't the primary thing, but rather social life, and so, uh, uh, so, uh, this, so I would tend to reinterpret uh, the linguistic nature of a text like this, or the the, the foregrounding of language, of writing, and so on, in, um, in other terms, in terms of, uh, of social experience, or what happens to social experience, in terms then of um, the autonomization of writing. Uh, if you want to uh, look again at Deleuze's description of schizophrenic language, schizophrenic language is language that's a part object. Your world is broken down to the point where even words are like objects, come before you like foreign objects, and so forth. Well, then, in that case, um, uh, they become part of the objects that you put back together in the, in the work of art. But, but, but if that's the case, what's primary is not language, but this disintegration of the world. Um, now, the other uh, thing that I wanted to, um, I think this notion of the analogon then allows one also to deal with generic shifts in Beckett. That is, the very nature of this vehicle uh, changes when one passes from the theater to the, uh, to, to, to the novelistic text. Now, the other uh, um, point I wanted to make about uh, this, um, and this, uh, then, uh, and let me tie that back to what I'm saying about conceptual art. This is conceptual art in the sense that, obviously, the use of the analogon is going to require us now uh, to redirect our attention to the work in a reflexive way. And so the work seems to become auto-referential, that is, uh, Beckett's um, uh, description of the absurd is in reality, uh, uh, ha takes in reality as its referent the theatrical text or the novelistic text. It isn't a statement about life, it's a statement about the work. But I think that's a more complicated kind of autoreferentiality than meets the eye because uh, the reason for it is the necessity of this use of the analogon as a uh, as a strategy. Okay, the other place I want to talk about um, uh, reflexivity and, and uh, this, for, this almost conscient uh, play with uh, categories of narrative and so on is in dealing with characters and plot and so forth because clearly uh, this is the very, uh, this is the, the, the crux of these things unless, um, uh, <coughs> unless this heap of fragments can be put back together in some narratable way um, uh, nothing can, can, can happen, or we have really something like um, uh, like Watt as the kind of ultimate final monument uh, that's possible for a kind of schizophrenic uh, writing. Now, uh, <coughs> it seems to me that first we want to say that um, uh, this object world, uh, one, one would want to devise a description of this object world, which would be uh, somehow adequate. Uh, what, what, and I haven't, I, I don't really have the, the means to do that. Um, what's peculiar is that you have objects that are all uh, the things in, in uh, Malloy's pockets, uh, the things in Malone's um, uh, uh, closet, uh, all these, these broken bits and pieces of things which you count, these are objects that you enumerate that have additive relations to each other that have no context anymore, it seems to me. That's the essential thing. They're always in isolation. They've lost this totality or background that we talked about last time and, and so on and so forth. These are objects that can never become symbols. Um, are they fetishes? I think they're not even fetishes. That is, these are not objects uh, Malloy sucks these stones, but one can't say that that's a libidinal, uh, that that's a, a, a libidinal thing. It seems to me that uh, they are objects which are beyond libidinal cathexis. Uh, they have no capacity. They're, they're, they're distinguished from other kinds of objects uh, by, um, by their incapacity to bear any kind of symbolic meaning. Uh, and what they represent, if you like, is pure Contingence, but that in a non-existential way. Remember that Sartre, uh, this was the ultimate, uh, this was the, 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 the ultimate cutting edge of the existential experience, was to show the contingency of objects. 
But Sartre's objects in the garden scene in, in nausea, when we finally reach the contingencies of objects, these objects are sort of uh, um, hallucinatory with life. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're alien to the point of obscenity, and they're whole sets of images of, of the tactile and of, uh, and of the obscene and of, uh, of life and the organic and so on, which are sort of overwhelming in that description. Uh, that's clearly not this experience in, in Beckett. These objects are a contingent in a much more uh, radical way. They're completely neutralized. That, that one would want to uh, somehow um, take into account this loss of affect uh, by the breakdown of, uh, of the object world. Well, you have to understand that people are also objects like this in Beckett. All of these objects are identical but different. Uh, so are people. Now, uh, it seems to me then that the problem of making stories is the same as the problem of making inventories or enumerations of objects. Uh, so one of the things you can do for, for with people is enumerate them, but after the, the Lynch, the, 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 the genealogy of the Lynch family in Watt, there isn't a whole lot more one could do with that. And so, uh, so that's a kind of dead end. Um, so I think let's start, we start by reconstructing all this in the abstract. We say, let's, let's say that the problem with Beckett, for Beckett in creating a, a narrative, is that um, you, you have no, there is no longer any meaningful way that these separate items, which are two separate characters, can be put back together. Uh, or rather, there are only a certain number of logical possibilities. They can be added together. So you can have one plus one. These are two characters which are uh, somehow additively connected. Well, then we have the teams, uh, the, uh, the two bums in Waiting for Godot. Um, then uh, we can uh, sort of, um, we can say one meets one. That would be uh, maybe even more of an event, although not really. Uh, well, then we have this, the, this marvelous emblematic vision of the opening of Waiting for Godot, the two people walking in different directions on the road who pass each other. Nothing happens, but they meet. These two absolutely identical items uh, uh, meet. Well, what other possibilities are there? And if you can think of more, uh, I'd be grateful because it's, it's, it's very hard to sort of think these, uh, think these things. This is a one plus one which doesn't add up. It's a one meets one in which nothing happens. Well, one gets substituted for one. And this is, again, a process in Beckett where you have one character, and then uh, this character turns into another character, or takes the place of another character. So Watt takes the place of, I don't know, uh, Erskine or whoever it is, and then uh, when he leaves, somebody else takes his place. And it doesn't matter. They're the same, but they're different. doesn't matter. Uh, later on, but this becomes more interesting, Moran takes the place of Malloy, or maybe is Malloy, we don't know, uh, and so on. So this is a process which can uh, conceivably give rise to certain kinds of forms. Finally, uh, we have, uh, and maybe we should have started with this because it would be the most natural one from our point of view, one can be in a hierarchical relationship to one. That is, one can be either uh, superior to, to, to the other one or inferior. Well, then we get Lucky and Pazzo, uh, or Ham and Clove, uh, uh, who are the variants of Lucky and Pazzo in, in Endgame. Uh, or uh, we get um, Malloy and the people who uh, give him his orders, or Moran and the people who give him his orders, or Mr. Knott and Watt. Uh, we get a hierarchical setup which is understood in terms of master and, and slave, essentially, but which is also without content, you see. These things can change position absolutely, which is what happens in, um, uh, in Waiting for Godot, that is, it's reversed. Um, uh, uh, and um, now, uh, what I want to, uh, what I want to show, um, well, one of, the, one of the things, obviously, that's going to, um, that's going to uh, trouble this empty formal working of these, of these permutations uh, is sex. Because clearly, um, uh, 
there you, there you have a difference which can't be uh, equalized by uh, one plus one or meets one or whatever. So I think that th this explains the impulse in Beckett to old age because in extreme old age, that's the moment when the sexes are the most alike, you know. When you get um, Malone and Mall, and the names are even almost the same, uh, or, uh, or Malloy and the women he meets, uh, or Malloy and his mother, let's say, uh, you get uh, physical bodies which uh, are, are practically indistinguishable anyway, and so we're back in the world of identities. Uh, and this, this, the sexual differentiation has been neutralized at least as much as it's possible to do. So that this must be a unisexual world and a world in which uh, there, are, uh, there's, there are empty differences. Uh, people are different as a stone is from an old, um, uh, a, a broken pipe uh, stem, but that difference is not important. You know. uh, they have to be different, that's the way each uh, identity is defined, but yet it's meaningless. Um, okay, now, uh, how can anything come of that? Uh, I think the, this, the hierarchical situation is the most interesting uh, for our purposes because it seems to me one really can uh, reconnect this to, to the description of schizophrenia we were, we were trying to give the last time. Remember that we said that uh, one of the more interesting diagnoses of um, uh, schizophrenia is um, as, a, as a language disorder, uh, and if you like, as a kind of uh, as a kind of communicational situation, that is, um, uh, schizophrenic voices and the like are um, are for for clue, are foreclosed, are um, worse than repressed, excluded, in such a way that they come back unidentified, so that uh, the schizophrenic uh, essentially. Here's a, it's an experience that everybody's had, you know. Uh, uh, you th you you're you're thinking something, and then you wonder, did you actually say that, or or, or have you not yet said it to the other person? Uh, uh, well, this is, I think, on a on a kind of low level of intensity, what the experience of hallucination is. That is, this is these are the voices that come your own voice, which comes back from the outside, as though it were the voice of another, and it's very interesting. Uh, in this connection, that Freud, for Freud, um, the, um, the the superego, uh, the censor, the paternal uh, fa uh, function, uh, the authority, the position of authority, uh, is initially an auditive phenomenon. Uh, the mother uh, is sensory, the mother is taste and smell and warmth and so on, but the father, qua father, is a voice a voice that speaks and says, don't do this. Um, so uh, essentially, the whole notion of hierarchy, father, authority uh, is auditory and is involved in these, uh, uh, in these perceptions of voices coming from the outside. Well, uh, it seems to me that here we have, um, we can go in two directions. We can say, look, um, uh, this would be sort of one of the directions that Deleuze might take us in with his problem of whether he's talking about real clinical schizophrenia or ideal schizophrenia, um, whether he's talking about uh, the relationship between schizophrenia as a, both as a clinical phenomenon and an ideal, and capitalism, that is social, uh, 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 actual uh, social formations, um, we can say, look, um, in a way, we don't have to diagnose Beckett and say Beckett is a schizophrenic, which is something that may be of interest to, to his immediate family, but, but not to any of us. Um, all we have to do is say uh, the, the objective situation of uh, the writer at Beckett's moment in time uh, is, a schizophrenic, uh, is a schizophrenic one in this sense that uh, there's no longer any public that this is precisely uh, a sending out of the voice which sort of comes back in the void uh, and so on and so forth um, is a kind of um, uh, uh, is a uh, is a kind of textual situation which doesn't even have uh, the these um, small group publics that one could imagine 
for uh, classical modernism in which you get lay churches forming around various writers, both in their immediate environment and in their readership and so forth, uh, private religions and converts to private religions, people who are uh, passionately uh, Joyceans or Poundians or Lacanians or whatever, you know. Um, uh, that doesn't obtain anymore in this situation because there's nothing, uh, there's nothing um, uh, on the outside. So in a way, uh, the schizophrenic, the structure of the schizophrenic experience uh, is doubled by the objective situation of the, um, uh, of the writer. Uh, the other way we can look at it is that this schizophrenic situation, the voice ends up being projected out in the form of characters. So that the two great stations of uh, Beckett's uh, plots are already implicit in this um, structure of the foreclosed voice. That is, uh, uh, how do you get a situation of hierarchy? You get, you're, you're, you're there uh, thinking and writing and compulsively organizing the stones or the objects and so on. And another appears and tells you to do something. Uh, and indeed, there's a kind of vanishing structure of these things because that other represents another other and so on, all the way up to God, but that's a meaningless concept. But, um, well, this is the very structure of the voice. So the Beckett other, uh, the, uh, the superior who gives you, who comes and tells you what to do, is simply this voice coming back. But it's a voice which has now been crystallized as an actor or an actone. Uh, and this voice uh, is your own voice, but it comes back from the outside and says, write all this, uh, or do all this, or, or, or whatever. Uh, and finally, uh, then, out of this um, immediate communicational situation, uh, this fact that language always has two poles, whether you're talking to yourself or not, uh, the two poles are somehow generated in the work, and one gets something which, which looks like an old-fashioned plot, even though it isn't anymore. Now, um, <coughs> this is the sense in which I think one would want to look at, um, at, at, at Malloy and understand what's going on there, because uh, it seems to me that um, in Malloy you have almost a, a, a kind of justification for this, uh, for this whole process, that is the... the, uh, the um, the movement in Malloy is really twofold. Um, it's a movement towards, in the first, uh, um, in, in the in the first part, towards a kind of radical immobilization and schizophrenia and so on, towards a kind of um, uh, stripping of everything of content of every kind of content and until we have nothing but the the abstract categories, nothing but writing itself. And then it's as though, but that was already what was happening in, in, in Watt, no doubt, and in, in a kind of non-reflexive level. And it's as though that's somehow not, that's not self-justifying. That doesn't, that, 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 that really doesn't yet have its own um, inner uh, uh, um, logic about it. And so we have to go all the way back. We have to start much further back in the second part with the older kind of realistic material. The, all the Moran material and the, the and the priest and the and the and the servant and the dinner and the soup and the sun and all that, and we have to bring that to the same point, and that has to be stripped uh, of of its content too, and and made uh, uh, and brought to the point when it will become indistinguishable from um, from the from the Malloy uh, from the Malloy material, and then after that. Uh, the circular process is is not necessary, and we just we end up with a kind of um, uh, kind of random production of these things uh, later on, or a fastment of these various moments into each other um, later on. So it seems to me that Malloy is a very uh, ambiguous work in in Beckett's uh, uh, in, in in Beckett's production because, um, in a way, it's almost um, it's as though he were turning. The, the, the genuine schizophrenic experience or experiment of Watt into something that looked like modernism again. That is, it's as though, uh, and you understand this recoding, decoding stuff is up. These are so many vicious circles. That is, this go, the, these things can go on sort of indefinitely. It's as though Beckett were then, uh, in his modernist period, trying to make out of this, again, something that looks like a private language, a private religion, a whole Beckett 
system uh, and so on. It seems to me that, that it's on that misunderstanding, um, that misreading of, of the Beckett of Waiting for Godot, of the Beckett of Malloy, that Beckett's reputation rests, uh, that Beckett's reputation as a modernist writer rests. Because it seems to me that that's only a momentary containment and that that is also unraveled in the later books of the trilogy and, and, and thereafter and in other plays. Uh, but that unraveling somehow um, ought to be very damaging to the moment of stasis that you find in, in, uh, in Malloy. But uh, since it's become institutionalized, in a way uh, it, it isn't. And, uh, and the Beckett that we see is rather uh, the modernist one than, uh, than the postmodernist or... Uh, uh, or schizophrenic one. Um, okay, well, I think uh, that's the point at which I'll have to end here. I feel that uh, one should say alongside of all this that, uh, uh, that this kind of reflection on, uh, on, on postmodernism as, as the art language of, uh, of this society uh, ought not to be understood in a deterministic way. That is, it seems to me that also, um, alongside of this, there's, there's, uh, there are other forms of art, artistic discourse uh, which are neither realistic nor modernistic. Uh, there's, there still are forms of political discourse that we don't, that are incompletely uh, explored. I'm thinking of Tenere's films, for example, as, a, uh, as, a, as, as one example of that. Uh, I don't know what form those things take in, in the realm of, uh, of, of the novel, and maybe indeed uh, the, 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 the form of the novel is such that um, uh, the political discourse uh, or a, a political art can't really, um, can't really use the novel uh, as, or is immediately alienated by uh, the, the, the disembodied quality of the novel. But, um, uh, but it seems to me that we can't understand the problems about that kind of political political art unless we see how everything in, in, in our society is really moving in, in other directions and, uh, and closing off a whole number of, um, uh, of issues to, of, of escape hatches for aesthetic discourse, uh, which is then forced in these, uh, in these channels that we've tried to, to look at this time. So thank you for your patience and uh, I've had a good year.